Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Tiger Gao. Here with me today is my co-host Owen Ingo. Uh, Owen, would you like to introduce our guest today? Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm very excited about our guest today. Um, Tom Lydon, he's he's one of the early solar pioneers. Since the 1980s, he's been fighting for a clean energy future all across the US and, and abroad. After numerous positions in the renewable energy industry, in 2016, he joined EDF Renewable Energy, which is a global leader in renewable energy and storage with six gigawatts of wind and solar in North America and 824 megawatt hours of storage worldwide. At EDF, Tom serves as a senior director and helps lead at Solar Plus Storage Group. Tom's also a graduate of Princeton University, class of 77, and has played a huge role in helping our campus become cleaner and greener in its energy consumption. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Great to be here, guys. So I think I'd love to kind of start off by, by talking a little bit about your career. Obviously, you've, you've held numerous positions across, across the industry, and you've been uh, global, you've been to Africa, you've been to East Asia, and you spent your entire career in the clean energy industry. So what led you to this field back in the 1980s? And how has your view on kind of the entire clean energy world changed over time? Yeah, I, so I was always interested in the environment uh, since high school. I had a great uh, biology teacher, <laughs> kind of inspired me. And, and, and actually at Princeton, um, I took rocks for jocks. You guys know that course. The, I don't know if they still call, call it rocks for jocks, but it's the introduction to geology. Stars for stoners, everything like that, you know. Is that what it is? Okay. Um, and I did a paper on solar energy and I just kind of turned me on. Um, that was my senior year. And after uh, school, um, I, I moved down to Maryland with some friends of mine and ended up working with a, um, with a real estate company. But I worked with a a builder there and he and I started the company uh, to do solar energy. This is 1980 now. Um, and back then it was solar thermal. So Jimmy Carter had put a investment tax credit in place. And so we were selling solar hot water systems, solar heating systems, some solar pool systems and built a little company uh, based on that called Maryland Energy Systems. So that was my start. And the truth is, once you get a bug in our industry, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to do something else. So um, I actually got out for a few years because when Reagan got elected, he pulled the tax credit, and uh, without the tax credit, the industry kind of collapsed. So I did something else for a few years. I, I ran a, I owned and operated a company up in Montreal, actually. Um, but after leaving Montreal, I came back, and I came back into the solar industry but this time um, on the photovoltaic side, because at that point, the cost of photovoltaics had come down and there were some incentives available around the country where you can actually make a uh, financeable solar project. And from that point on, I, had, uh, I joined, um, I either joined existing companies or I started my own. So I've, I've been working for, <laughs> almost 40 years now in the industry, believe it or not. The industry was nothing when I started. Uh, and I work with one company or the other, working on photovoltaics mostly. So at this point, the industry has come so far uh, that we're actually at a point, and it's really was 19, it was 2020 where this happened. We, we reached a point where solar energy is cheaper than building new generation, any kind of new generation, oil, gas, uh, nuclear, uh, and coal. And so now um, the industry is taking off in, in, in a very big way. Uh, we have more jobs in the solar industry than the steel and coal industry combined. And uh, our costs keep coming down. So it's pretty exciting for me to have seen this trajectory over my career. Um, and I'm excited about working with, with people like you to, to join us in, this, in the industry and, and, and help the industry grow to get to a point where we could be 100% renewable within our lifetime. Absolutely, and I, I really enjoyed kind of your thoughts on, on some of the tax stuff in terms of how that affected the industry early on. Um, we're, we're thinking about how 
how Carter put solar panels on his his own White House roof and subsequently got taken off and all that jazz. Um, so one one important thing in, in solar financing and in uh, clean energy financing as a whole is this tax structure. So uh, I would love to kind of dive into that. How, how does the fluctuation of policy affect the types of projects you invest in? And how do you account for potential changes in federal or state tax codes when you're, you're kind of diving into the, the nitty gritty details of those projects? Yeah, and it's very important, obviously. Um, just a little side note, uh, Reagan took those panels off the White House. George Bush Jr. put them back on. So they're actually, there is solar at the White House now. Uh, Trump probably has no idea. Um, I don't want him to know because maybe he'll take them off too. Um, anyway, uh, the U.S. doesn't really have a coherent national energy policy. They've kind of left it up to the states. And so what's happened um, the federal government has provided some incentives over time, nowhere near the incentives and subsidies they give to the fossil fuel industry. Um, but an investment tax credit was put in place. Um, it actually started during the uh, Reagan years, believe it or not. Um, and it's gone, it's fluctuated up and down a little bit, but by and large, we've had an investment tax credit at the federal level, which is a good starting point but not enough to make the numbers work well enough that it's financeable. Uh, most solar systems are not financeable. Uh, so what's happened, <clears throat> what's happened is a lot of the states or several of the states have, have jumped in and provided their own incentives. California being the number one state in the country by far with the uh, ongoing incentives that they've provided there and various programs to support clean energy and energy efficiency. Um, New Jersey, by the way, is, has been one of the best states consistently for, for years now. I've been in New Jersey since 2000 working on solar here. I've been involved in policy development. Um, and um, they have put in place not only a pretty good renewable portfolio standard, which includes a solar carve out, but also, also incentives that help make the, uh, the projects financeable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I completely agree that New Jersey has kind of been at the forefront. Um, and, and one thing that has happened quite recently, I don't know if you've, you've seen this, but New Jersey just passed one of the most comprehensive social and environmental justice laws in the country. And the law forces industrial sites to consider cumulative impact and the potential disproportionate effect of certain projects on some communities. So what's kind of your view on this in this uh, movement of social environmental justice? And, and the intersection of those two, and, and how do you at EDF promote this type of justice through your work? Yeah, I think actually by, by the nature of our technology, uh, it, it's very democratic in a way, um, democratic with a small d. Um, and I think the most clear uh, connection to social justice is what's emerging uh, as, as a pretty significant um, uh, policy um, uh, co construct, which is community solar. So the industry, the, the solar industry has pretty much been growing up on uh, residential solar sold to people that can afford it uh, or financed um, through various parties, but also to people that have credit and uh, or commercial and industrial projects to credit worthy entities. Um, and so what's happened is the people that are low and moderate income haven't had access to solar and its benefits. Um, and so this community solar uh, construct has been developed over the last several years where we can build a larger uh, solar project somewhere off site um, and put the energy, the electrons into the grid and we can give a credit from that system to people at low and moderate income. So that community solar has now given access to the solar industry and its benefits to even people that are in low and moderate income. That's probably, that's probably the best thing. The other thing is, you know, when, whenever you build solar, you're, you're reducing the need for coal or, or natural gas fired power and a lot of um, uh, lower income people are around those power plants. Um, and so that's, uh, that, that will alleviate that issue as well. 
Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed kind of hearing your thoughts and the small d democratic aspects and and thinking about how um, the community solar is is a big part of that um, reach towards environmental and, and social justice. You spent a good amount of your career abroad um, in, in a lot of countries that had much lower GDP per capita um, and, and were experiencing community solar and community renewable energy on a, on a different level than, than many Americans might experience it. So we, we, I'd love to kind of hear about your experience there and, and um, how that shaped your view on community solar and, and these concepts. Yeah, um, so I spent six years of my career doing that uh, for a company called World Water. Um, and, and our main focus was solar water pumping in remote areas. But we would do solar water pumping and we would do power systems. Uh, and, and this was just bringing power energy to these remote areas that don't have it. So multiple countries in Africa uh, where people are literally using kerosene lanterns still um and don't have access to electricity um and we were able to get projects funded through various um sources you know most char mostly charitable but some governments um would, would provide some benefits or some uh, support um that was a really like enriching part of my life um, because when you bring power or you bring clean water to these areas that now don't have that, it, it was just so rewarding. Um, so what's happened since then is the private sector is pretty much picking up in a lot of those areas where you have entrepreneurs of various stripes that are they're actually making businesses out of it. Uh, so place like India now, India has a lot of solar. Uh, Philippines, where I spent a lot of my time doing solar water pumping, there are solar uh, companies there now, um, significant ones, including one run by a Princetonian, by the way, um, that have created a sustainable business model. Um, so that's all good. So we're starting to get you know solar to places where they need it most. Um, you could say that's the highest and best use of our technology because these people didn't have access to good, reliable power or safe power. Uh, and how that relates back to uh, developed world is as you gain, as you get more volume in our technology, the prices come down. And that's really the story of the industry. The prices have continued to come down. They've leveled off a little bit now because we're reaching um, diminishing returns, but uh, they still continue to go down and it's made it to the point where even in even developed countries like the U.S., it's now the best way to generate new power. So, Tom, one thing that I'd love to touch on is in 2011, when reflecting on some of your experiences abroad, you, you published an awesome article called Solar Power for Peace. Would you mind describing your view on this piece and how you came to write this? Yeah, great. Um, there was this period in my career where I was going around the world doing solar water pumping and solar power systems and working with a company called World Water. Um, so I got to vi visit literally like 31, 32 countries, uh, all mostly emerging countries. And we were putting in solar water pumping systems or, or remote power systems. And, you know, I'd go into these villages like in Angola, as an example, I, I went, uh, we had, um, we had a sponsor from, from uh, Switzerland that had donated some money to put in a solar power system at a clinic in, in the middle of Angola. Uh, and I decided I was going to go over there and help them put it in. You know, besides, uh, that's not my job. My job was to develop projects and, you know, basically as VP of uh, sales and marketing. But I decided to go and put it in. And it was really eye-opening for me. First of all, you, you, you go into Angola and it looks like it's bombed out, you know? Um, and you get into this, we were in, um, we were putting this thing into a clinic, a, a medical clinic. And um, the, the, it was for power, for electricity in the clinic and also to, to pump their water. So they had a diesel generator, which is a lot, a lot of these remote areas that don't have power to the grid. Um, and, 
we were able, I was able to, in a week, working with the local people, these, the, the, the indigenous people <laughs> did not speak English and I'm showing them by sign language and stuff what to do and help me to install this. And in just a matter of a few days, we were able to put in a solar power system for the clinic so they have light um, for their operation, you know, for the operation center and uh, for, the, for the clinic in general, and also uh, energy to power their pump. Before they had a gen diesel gen set, but the diesel gen set would always break down and they needed power and they needed, uh, you know, uh, maintenance, which was very common. The value of that project was, you know, $10,000, $12,000. Um, so when I left, it's like I knew in my mind, it's like the value of that system for those people is invaluable. Um, and, and that was one experience. Another is we had some success in the Philippines with solar water pumping, mostly uh, moving water from one, um, uh, one area to the other for their crops, for, mostly for irrigation. But a lot of these countries, um, emerging countries, we were able to get to high levels of government and, and typically we'd meet them and like we meet with the Minister of Energy or the Ministry of Water. In the case of Philippines, we were actually connected to President Ramos at the time. And um, after doing a few of these solar water pumping projects, he called us into his office to talk about um, providing a solar water pumping system for the rebels the Muslim reb rebels in Mindanao. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but it, it, there's this island called Mindanao in, in the Philippines that the rebels have controlled for years. So President Ramos, who used to be a General Ron Ramos, um, asked us to go down there and put the, um, the solar water pumping system in as a peace initiative, which we did. So I, I wasn't there to do that, but our guys were. Afterwards, uh, some weeks afterwards, we, I, I met with the U.S. ambassador, this guy named Tom, Thomas Hubbard, <clears throat> and he told us the goodwill that we got from putting that $10,000, $12,000 solar, wa solar water pumping system in, 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 uh, in the rebel camp was incredibly valuable and it created this huge amount of goodwill. Um, so those, those two experiences, like, reminded me of how valuable doing real things in, in, in for our foreign relations. Um, in fact, Secretary Mattis, I, I, you know, I, I wrote in, in, the, in the piece, in the Solar Power for Peace article, said that the more we put into the State Department diplomacy, the less we have to put into military budget. It's my point of this piece is like, we have the opportunity to use our technology and instead of sending over drones and planes and bombs, we could, we could help these other countries that don't have access to clean power or, or power at all um, and provide a economic infrastructure for them. And those kind of investments are way more valuable than sending over bombs or you know, RVs and, um, uh, you know, planes and things like that. So that's that's my point of, of the article. I, I think we could do a lot better uh, than spending $700 billion a year on military equipment. We could be a lot more effective by putting things in place that help people improve their lives. Uh, Tom, I guess I'm more of a newcomer here compared to Owen when it comes to the en energy knowledge. So maybe I'll ask you a couple of very naive and foundational questions about solar energy. So we talked about uh, community solar. We, we talked about how it's democratic. Uh, it's easier for the community. Is this renewable? Uh, how does this currently actually work right now? So for example, if I'm an average household, either in New Jersey or in a developing country like India or the Philippines, uh, do, do I just get a couple panels and then directly plug it in into my own homes and that will work? Or does it fit into a larger... Uh, grid that, that, that is already working. Um, how does this process exactly work? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's another cool thing about solar is it's modular. It's extremely modular. So literally a solar panel, a solar module, we call them, <clears throat> a single one can be hooked up to a car battery, positive, negative lead and charge it. 
So that's that's the most um, you know um, simple. Um, if you want more energy, you, you put more panels together, and your home will have twenty panels. A you know Johnson and Johnson uh, manufacturing will have five thousand panels. Same panel, just connected differently. Same components, basically same components. So you have these panels that create DC energy. They go into a conversion or uh, system or an inverter, so-called, that converts the DC power to AC, and the AC power goes into the building. Uh, and and that's true whether it's a home, whether it's uh, you know a Home Depot, or whether um, it's going into the grid directly. Owen and I interviewed uh, Professor Dan Kamen from uh, UC Berkeley just last week, and he talked about this concept of microgrid. Uh, yep. is, is this kind of the similar idea here? So microgrid uh, has a lot of different uh, uh, there are a lot of different versions of microgrid. Microgrid just means that you have your own little grid that's self-sustaining, right? So if you have three solar panels and a battery and a light, that's a little microgrid, right? And if you're home, you have solar on, on the roof and you have batteries in the basement and, and the other electronic equipment, you could run your home when the power goes out. That's a microgrid. A microgrid could be more complex where you have a diesel generator, you have batteries, you have solar, you have wind. Um, for instance, EDF uh, is the utility in, in France and they're responsible for all the French islands. And all those islands are microgrids by nature. Micro just means smaller grids. Um, and so there is a kind of a movement now to be have more of that microgrid capability because power is not as reliable as it used to be because we're having more storms and more, you know, intense weather conditions. There are fires on California right now. There's hurricanes coming up through the Gulf. Those are places where a microgrid would be really uh, effective because they're, they're small and they're redundant um, and um, it just provides power. Uh, it, 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 there's more resiliency with microgrids. I also wanna follow up and, and talk about a, a different concept related to the grid. Um, in, in 2008, you joined industry experts and testified on the need for greater infrastructure investment and the role that investment could play in economic recovery. In your speech, you mentioned grid parity. Do you mind elaborating on what grid parity is and, and why it's so significant? And then also whether you foresee the U.S. reaching grid parity at, at any point in the near future? So when was this, 2008? Yes, yes. Sir. We keep referring back to the stuff from many, many years ago. <laughs> No, but the, this is the great news. We've reached grid parity we, this year. So from 2008, 2020, great, 12 years later. Um, so grid parity just means that the, it, it, solar is going to be the, you know, the new source of energy. And, and in fact, it is. I mean, renewables, wind and solar both. Um, you know, we always complain in the past about all, all these conventional sources of energy, oil, gas, nuclear, so forth. They always said subsidies, lots of subsidies. And we always had to fight for our subsidies. We maintained from the very beginning, if it was a play, level playing field, no subsidies there, no subsidies for us, we, would, we could compete. Well, now we're competing even without those uh, uh, massive subsidies that the fossil fuel industry gets. So. The exciting news is we've reached grid parity. Um, you know, I spoke at a divest uh, fossil fuel um, event recently. There is no reason to be investing in fossil fuel plants now. Pipelines, you know, gas generators, um, and there's billions of dollars being planned for, for those because solar is now cheaper than those. Solar and batteries and what's called clean energy portfolio, demand reduction. Um, that combination of technologies is cheaper than building new gas generation, okay? So that's grid, that's grid parity. The interesting thing there is that like by 2035, even operating existing gas plants will be more expensive than building new renewable plants. So we've reached that grid parity 
you know, you, you listen to some of the debates that are going on now uh, politically about climate change. Um, and this idea of, of natural gas as a tradition tra transition fuel, which has been true, that's a cleaner way to generate electricity than coal. So a lot of coal plants have, have switched to natural gas. That's why this is demand from pipelines, gas pipelines. But that transition's over now, starting this year. The transition is done. So even um, even Joe Biden is talking about transition still to you know to where we want to be in renewables. Uh, and I think that's true. That that's what's going to happen over the next several years. But we can accelerate that now because financially it's better to transition sooner than later. There's a lot of a lot of stuff to unpack, and I definitely want to go back to the your, your thoughts on natural gas in just a minute. But I know that you're you're from our previous conversations. Your view on the divest uh, from fossil fuel movement has changed over time. So I'd I'd kind of love to hear. Um, you, you explained a little bit of your thoughts behind that, but your initial viewpoint in terms of um, yeah, against that movement, and then it, like obviously you're you're currently speaking at events, um, uh, championing it. So how did that transition take place in, uh, intellectually for you, and and um, why do you think that we should divest from fossil fuels? Well, first of all, I mean there is a moral and ethical imperative to, to move away from fossil fuels, right? That's, that's underlines this whole thing. So, you know, for, for a university like Princeton with $26 million, billion dollar endowment, um, there's, there's good reason on moral and ethical terms to divest. But I've never been like that. I mean, in my entire solar career, we don't sell the environmental part of it. That might motivate people to talk to us, but it's always about the financial part, right? Making the numbers work. I'm a businessman and I wanna have a return on investment on my investment. And so what's happening in places like Princeton that have these, uh, and, and a lot of companies that are dealing with this as well, um, we, shareholders wanna see a movement away from fossil fuels for the moral and ethical reasons. But when you look just at the numbers, the numbers have changed. And starting this year, again, we've reached a point where it's not prudent to invest in fossil fuels anymore. And if you look at the evidence of, of the um, investment risk of fossil fuels and any, uh, many of the um, investments that you could look at that include fossil fuels are way underperforming the ones that are in future renewables fuels. I mean, it's so, it's so clear. And just when you think about BlackRock as an example, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock announced they're, they're, they're moving away, they're transitioning out of fossil fuels, they're divesting of, of coal and they're moving away from all fossil fuels. And they're not doing it just because they want to be good guys. They're doing it because the risk to them and their investors is extraordinary in the fossil fuel industry where there are alternatives. And the alternative right now is, is um, renewable energy. And those funds are doing very well right now. Um, and, and frankly, if Biden gets elected with some form of, of green uh, plan, um, it'll be put on steroids even more. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And one um, article that I was reading earlier today by, I believe, Bloomberg New Energy Finance was talking about how they see that, that the ETFs have kind of uh, reversed course in terms of some of the industrials versus, versus clean energy. So uh, I think the main thesis of that article was that, was that uh, the green stocks have already priced in uh, and green uh, green investors have already been priced in uh, to a Biden win. Do you would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I bought into one of the <laughs> ETFs, uh, the, the Invesco uh, Solar ETF. Uh, I bought into just literally a couple months ago, and it's already gone up like fifty percent. Um, so, and I was thinking this. I was just thinking, look. <clears throat> 
I want to invest in the entire industry. And that's what the ETF does rather than pick a individual company, which I do. I have some of those, but I'd rather invest in the entire industry. And if Biden gets elected, which I hope and expect that he will, there will be more money behind it to, to help uh, accelerate. And so I want to be in solar. And I think that's exactly what happened. And Bloomberg exactly right, because there was a jump up and then it's kind of leveled off a little bit right now. But we'll see what happens. Uh, just a quick follow up question on that, Tom, about um, uh, the ETF and I guess largely what we call ESG funds or um, the, the divestment movement. I, I've talked to people and some say that the ESG funds are often graded on a curve uh, as put by a uh, um, Matt Levine from Bloomberg, he's a very famous writer, and he says a lot of times it's just regular funds uh, that still track the markets, still track a lot of the performances of fossil fuel industries, but then you add up a couple, you know, quote unquote, environmentally friendly, conscious companies, um, because if you were to only invest in environmentally friendly companies, you probably wouldn't make as good of a return. So it seems that you reject that notion because it seems that from this year on, uh, the more renewable stuff are, are finally making the, the money. So are we at a sea change right now or, or did we already see the sea change happen for a while? It's just people didn't realize that. Uh, well, it's been happy. It's been happening just over the last, what, you know, year, year and a half. I mean, I'm looking at, I'm looking at these energy sector um, uh, indicators, right? S and P as an example. Uh, but if you look at the five-year analyzed, re analyzed return, of energy, which is conventional energy, it's minus five and a half percent over five years. That's their annual return. The S and P is like eight and a half percent. So, as a fund manager, why would you be investing in these crazy, you know, uh, risky industries? Um, and energy is at the bottom of all sectors: financials, healthcare, industrials, real estate, tech. It's crazy. And I think, you know, Fink at um, BlackRock has recognized that and he's putting his, you know, money where his mouth is. One, one thing kind of to pivot away from this conversation a little bit is your work at EDF. 